Uh, hi everyone, I'm Matt. You should do introductions first, I guess. Um, I'm Fatima, Caitlin, Ryan, and Emily. Uh, as was introduced, we're going to be talking about Aboriginal engagement. Um, and before we jump right into it, uh, I just wanted to introduce two as uh, aspects of this that we're not going to have time to talk about, but we think it is important to turn our minds to as we talk about the issue in the future. Uh, one is the inclusion of actual Aboriginal people when you're making these kinds of uh, discussions happen. We noticed that at five of us, um, one person identified as 113 AT. Um, so we just think that's an important, <laughs> important uh, aspect to, 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 to consider is inclusion. Uh, and the second one is raising the profile of Aboriginal issues in larger um, non-formal campus-like events and clubs and that kind of stuff. Um, but what we're actually going to be addressing head on today is uh, the integration of Aboriginal content, um, whether traditional or not, uh, into the formal learning process here at UBC. Um, one key area of concern is ensuring not only cultural sensitivity, but also relevance. Um, like was mentioned in supporting materials, often curricula regard Aboriginal people as objects of study rather than as um, active participants in the creation of knowledge. And as we mentioned, none of us here identify as Aboriginal or as status Aboriginal. Um, so it makes it difficult to come up with adequate and more importantly, relevant solutions without involving and seeking input and perspective from the First Nations communities. So um, even at the first step of designing curricula and amending curricula, it's vital to not fall into an exclusionary trap. So that's an important paradigm to make sure we're in. Um, so we discussed two things that we feel would help integrate Aboriginal perspectives um, into, the per into the classroom. Um, these came from our experiences taking classes where these were integrated well and classes as well where they were um, either not, it was not handled very well or um, was not handled well. Um, so the first thing we discussed uh, was focusing uh, more on 100 level classes and curriculum. Uh, frequently these are survey classes and so these are they're, the topics are more broad. And there is room there for uh, sections surrounding um, Aboriginal issues or um, uh, Work, there's more chances for to integrate that sort of learning into those classes um, and open people's eyes to it earlier in their university career, um, as opposed to maybe running a seminar class um, later when people have already sort of picked their track um, and know sort of where they're going and what lens they're looking at, at their education group. Um, to go along with that, uh, we talked about some departments seem to be doing better at Aboriginal um, content and integration into, into the curriculum than others. So finding ways for those departments that are doing well to maybe help um, the departments that are struggling and sharing best practices and things like that um, so that the content um, is being spread uh, throughout the board. It's not only happening in, in, certain, um, in certain departments in arts or, or things like that. Um, the second idea was um, using case studies um, as perhaps an effective way of uh, integrating Aboriginal content into, into uh, a variety of classrooms and curriculums. And um, it was gives a more hands-on opportunity for students um, to engage with um, new information about First Nations, uh, about perspectives and issues that they may be facing. So, that's going to So, as Kaylin said, an implementation is we really want to engage um, all the faculties across campus to and encourage them uh, to all excel in incorporating Aboriginal content in their curriculum. Uh, like through case studies or having focused assignments, we understand that not all classes are uh, case study applicable. And so we really want to encourage people to have uh, specific examples for Aboriginal um, issues. Uh, we also want to challenge professors and deans of the faculties to really include the content and, and really not necessarily push the issue, but encourage it amongst their staff. Uh, this will um, encourage a wider spread of information, and we understand that people may have to opt out just because it's not applicable for everyone. So in order to engage with this commitment in place of promise, we've identified two options for graduating students and current alumni. First of all, there can be focus groups to ensure that the content is applicable and relevant as we talked about, both from the non-Aboriginal perspective and the Aboriginal perspective. And beyond that, we've suggested that there could be a mentorship program, specifically for non-Aboriginal students who are interested in getting to a field that involves Aboriginal affairs, as well as for Aboriginal students just interested in any career um, that they'd like to meet up with a mentor. Uh, and that would give them the option to really just excel and get involved. So that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Any feedback? Yeah. <laughs> well, there was an interesting talk about that actually on decolonization that we've been seeing around the <coughs> department and what this in court students are doing for the way, relating to what you're saying about. Do you 
you think there's a case to be made that at UBC, the expectation for an undergraduate graduating from any program should be higher with respect to Aboriginal fluency and understanding that it is for any other university in Canada? Um, I don't know if it should be more so, but I do think that it should be an expectation. Um, perhaps in, at UBC because we are, it's more uh, an issue that we can, that we see frequently because we are on Mass Green Land and that's something that we bring up frequently even at the start of the SLC that was mentioned. I think it's something that is in, an, it, it does come up frequently at the university, um, but I think for a lot of people, if the, the first and last thing they hear about it is uh, we are on Mass Green Land and, you know, we appreciate that, um, perhaps then there is, there is space for people to have more understanding about that. Um, and just as someone, I'm a political science student, student, and I can see moving forward that Aboriginal issues and Aboriginal understanding is something that is important and something that is going to become more important in the future. Um, not, and it's certainly not going to become less important as treaties and things move forward. It's uh, something that I think is important, going to be important for all students um, leaving university uh, as an important like aspect of their education. But that's I would say more just my. At this point, doing a BA in poli sci, can you get out of? Can you get through the major? Without an enhanced understanding, do you think of um, Aboriginal yeah. affairs? You can't. Easily. Okay. Easily. Does that strike you as um, appropriate? Uh, maybe not. Um, I would say that more, uh, just in my personal experience, more of the Aboriginal content that I've been exposed to at UBC has been through the history department, mm -hmm. um, which is a minor. I have taken um, some classes specifically in poli sci that would relate more to Aboriginal issues, but those have been classes that I took and chose as opposed to um, other. Like, I would say there's a lot of people that didn't have that interest and so chose other classes. Um, that was actually one point that we had been discussing was mm -hmm. that um, like within the Faculty of Arts there's a certain number of language requirements, science requirements, literature requirements that every student is expected to take. <coughs> We're trying to figure out whether we would be able to incorporate like a First Nations Studies um, component and how that would work out with different credit requirements for different majors whether in applied science or in arts. Um, how many electives we'd be able to have, and that was um, definitely food for thought, even in terms of figuring out whether we could use more three credit courses so people would have more flexibility in adding one as opposed to six credit ones. Um, personally, I haven't, I'm in second year, I haven't taken very many um, courses that pertain to First Nations issues, so my first year geography class did um, have a very interesting component that actually inspired me to go and read more about it afterwards. Um, but I think it's Part of it is people have to motivate themselves to go learn about it, but I also feel like there should be incentives for people to go learn more about these issues. Um, like I advise in class Fanny, and we have the Wewa Library and the First Nations House of Learning, like literally 30 seconds outside of my dorm. Yeah, I, I assume less than 50% of the residents there have actually ever gone inside. So um, I guess finding ways to motivate people to go and learn more. Um, within the classroom or if they don't have the credit flexibility to go um, and just approach the different things that we do have on campus. And coming from Ontario, I definitely see a lot more Aboriginal incorporation into the land and into the buildings and into the ceremonies here than we do back home. But um, again, it's motivation that is the issue. If I could just add, uh, I graduated from the Faculty of Law and I thought that going through that education was for all a really good example of how they integrated Aboriginal content to everything that we did. Uh, law classes, criminal classes, um, you know, uh, property, everything. There was, there was, um, it wasn't even presented most of the time as a distinct component. It was just an aspect that we always have to turn our mind to because in practice we do. So I think it's, a, it's kind of normalized. It's just another absolutely critical. And it helped a lot that a lot of our professors were Aboriginal. I won't go on about this, I'll just say that in terms of your student voice, I think it's very important that you raise it, and you, as you're doing now, and raise some of your exhortations and ideas uh, about how the university can make good on what's in place and promise on this. Because if we wait for the administrators and for the department heads and curriculum committees and all the other you know, important posts around the areas to do it, um, it, it may not happen without a good, strong student push. I mean, obviously coming up with something that's equivalent of a language requirement would be very provocative. But it's maybe exactly the kind of institution-wide decision we can have.